Okay, and so today we are moving on to chapter seven. But as mentioned, chapter seven we're doing in two parts. Why? Because it's complicated. Um, it's a tough process, um, and I think you need a little bit more time with it. So today what we're going to cover, we'll look, outline all of the learning objectives for chapter seven. You're going to do a case study discussion um, with people you're sitting next to, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the material. But just to start us off, show of hands, who has attempted to read chapter seven? Okay, it just, it, so I know how much to cover and go over and how much not to. Try them again. How many of you have read some of chapter seven? Okay, but just over half, that's good. So, if I can get you that, guys, to... Try and put your phone away. Thank you. Okay, so chapter seven has four learning objectives, just four, but they're really complicated processes. Um, and it's essentially the process you go to to decide which customers you're going to serve. Um, and the idea is market segmentation, targeting, differentiation, and positioning, or the STP process, segmentation, targeting, and positioning. Today we're only going to go through the segmentation and targeting part, and we'll talk about positioning uh, on Monday, or sorry, Tuesday. So we'll look at how we segment a market, and it's different for consumers than it is for individuals, and we're going to look at differentiation and positioning on Monday. So that's the deal. So in your textbook you have this lovely slide showing you again the process. So we're going to do the first half today, the second half next lecture. So segmentation, divide the total market into smaller segments, and targeting, selecting the segment of the target to enter. Um, and then once you've made, so it's about making the choice. Today is the choice part, and Tuesday is the how part. So we get back to the, well, why part. Um, and classic, we talk about the market being like a pie. And you always see pie charts for market share. Um, so let's go with pie, like all the way with pie. Um, so why do we even segment markets? What's the point? Can anyone tell me? Why not try and market to everyone? Sorry? No way can you meet all your, their needs. Why else can't you market to everyone? <laughs> you can't afford to. Definitely. And um, so we segment it, and, and we want to build the right relationship with the right customer. So we divide up the market. We slice up the pie. Um, because different people, well, they like different flavors, right? That's the deal. So if you have different needs and wants in the market, then you, um, and the, the, if the answer is no, and they don't need a different product, place, promotion, or price, then you don't segment. Like, if you can have that whole pie to yourself, why would you take a slice out? That's the question. Um, if everybody wants the same thing, you don't need to cut it up. You don't need to segment. So that's the first question. No, you got the whole thing. You're good. It's all yours. One flavor for everyone. But if there are different needs and wants, um, and you have to meet those different wants with either a different product or a different place or a different price and or a different promotion strategy, well, then you have to segment the pie. You have to offer different things. Um, and so that's your first choice. Do we have a homogenous market in which there is no variation in needs and wants? Or do we have a differentiated market where people want different things? And there's very, very few markets where everybody wants all the same thing. Very few. Almost all markets are differentiated in some way. So I want to show you a video of uh, one particular market with the product you're familiar with. You're going to be doing some thinking about this. I apologize for the quality of the video. It looks like someone held their cell phone up to a TV. Not even joking with you, but it's the best I could find, but the, the information, the actual news report <laughs> on the video is really worth watching. So have a look. When you have an American classic like the Oreo, why change it? 
For Kraft, the answer was simple, because after bringing the Oreo to China in 1996, sales started to sag. We started to do some research and said, gee, you know, I'm not sure everybody really likes this this American version, which is quite sweet. So we started testing alternatives, and it took us a long time and a lot of prototypes because we were trying to get exactly the right balance. And then... Lorna Davis heads Craft China. She says remaking the Oreo helped double sales in two years and made Oreo the number one selling biscuit in China. That first variation on the original, one that looks the same but is less sweet. And here's the biggest riff on the original, the Oreo wafer stick. We discovered that the wafer market was very, very big here in China, and we didn't have an offer in wafer. And consumers really liked Oreo, but actually they like wafers. So we launched this product, which is a chocolate-coated wafer, and it, has, uh, it comes in a, in a, in a pre-packaged product like this. Oh. And in 2006, this was the biggest single SKU, or biggest single item in China. It's the product that made history for Kraft, not only because it's so different from the original, but because it's the first product developed in the China market and now sold in Canada, Korea and Australia. I like the big front face. The hope is this kind of entrepreneurial spirit in local markets will spur Kraft's next big sellers. Automatic hit. People just loved it. Yes. Okay. Right, let's go this try. You can tell it's an Oreo. It may look different. It tastes like an Oreo. Yeah. That says a lot for our R&D people because she managed to create a coated wafer product that still tastes like an Oreo. That's really impressive. From there, the number of variations grew. White chocolate covered wafer sticks, a cookie lined with cream that can be used as a straw, and a super long wafer cookie. The, um, the wafer sandwich, so you can see it behaves exactly the same as an Oreo. You just have to take it apart. And of course, it's extremely dunkable. Kraft also came out with a smaller and more affordable pack of cookies. So one of the things we found was that there were many people in, uh, in China who really liked Oreo, but their absolute available, available money at any time was not enough for a full pack of Oreos. Full pack of Oreos here is about 70 US cents. And so this pack is 35 cents, and it does particularly well in the second and third tier cities. So even that pricing difference, selling something for 35 U.S. cents versus 70 U.S. cents makes that much of, of a difference in sales. A very big difference. And to get consumers to try the new Oreos, a promotional blitz from in-store samples, which often result in immediate sales, to commercials that showed consumers the traditional American way of eating Oreos. From twisting the Oreo apart and licking the cream to dunking them in milk, all of it foreign to the Chinese consumer. And what I think is important with Oreo is that the ritual is on the surface of it about cookies and dunking into milk. The reality is many people, even Americans, don't dunk it. But it's a moment of connection. It's a moment of, of, of fun between parents and children particularly. Market that I'm um, so in uh, in China is well Nabisco sells them in the United States here it's Mr. Christie's um, is the brand but it's Mondelez International so um, and in in China it was Kraft sub brand of Kraft but the uh, owner of Oreos Mondelez why did they have to what market were they even segmenting sorry. Not the wafer market. So was it all of Asia? Ta-da. Uh, no, it was specifically the country, but was it like uh, the whole country, the whole market? What's a market? Sorry? Families? So they were, they were looking to target families, but what was the market? How would you define the market? Right, that was one of the preferences in the market, but I want to step back and go, okay, this is marketing. We need to be able to define a market. Before you start segmenting, what's the whole pie? Food, snack, 
Cookies. Nailed it. Yeah, I got more. Uh, so the specifically, um, it's considered uh, the biscuit. Uh, in terms of packaged foods, the category definition where you would find nakes and things like that is the sweet biscuits, snack bars, and fruit snacks. They're all considered um, one segment, one uh, kind of processed or packaged food. Um, and that would be what? The 10th largest in terms of revenue of the packaged food available. Where did I get this data? Aha, uh -huh, Passport. Passport brought it up. Um, and what, all I had to do was Google Oreo or search Oreos in the Passport and look at what it came up with. So the 10th largest market for packaged foods, sweet biscuits, snacks, and fruit snacks. But specifically, they weren't looking to segment the North American market and not even the whole Asian market, but the Chinese market. Um, and so did they have to change the product? Yeah, so in what ways did they change the product? They made it less sweet. Yeah. They made wafers. So why did they make wafers? Look how much you participate when there's cookies on the line. I love it. OK, noted. Um, yeah, so the preference was for less sweet. That was the starting point, right? Um, and the familiarity and the preference was for wafers. Uh-huh, definitely. Any other product changes you saw? The smaller packaging? Um, that was actually a pricing marketing mix change. It was to offer a different price point, right? Um, and obviously really successful. Um, what about place? Did they do anything in terms of distribution that was different? They had lots of promotions. That's also a promotion. It's called sales promotion. Yeah, interestingly, they expanded the distribution. They started there, meeting the needs of that market, and then found out whether it worked elsewhere. Cookies for you. OK, so um, then promotion. We had the in-store sampling. The commercial, yeah. Where, where was commercial coming from? Ah. <laughs> for real, who was? OK, yeah, so they had a commercial. And what was the commercial trying to show? This, we don't just talk about this till later. Should they show the traditional way that Americans would eat Oreos? Yeah, which was the, the dunking thing. Um, we're going to talk about milk on Tuesday, actually. But I'm not going to throw milk at you. <laughs> we're going to talk about milk for the next one. Um, so since its introduction in 1912 in the United States, Oreo, ever since its introduction, has been the best-selling cookie. Um, and now it's the best-selling brand of cookies as well in China, also from Passport. So it's, it has the global market share lead. Now that's not, doesn't sound like a huge number. 3.8% of the Chinese market. The Chinese market's rather large, however. That's a lot. Um, and you'll see some of the brands up there, including they also own Chips Ahoy. They have Belvita. So they weren't, I don't even know what those are. Anybody? What's Belvita? Healthier ones? Cardboard cookies. Right, fakers. Yeah. <laughs> right, no, that's not the real deal. Um, and in terms of a brand share, Right, so significant in China, number one. So now we have to look at, okay, so when they saw the Chinese market for biscuits, that's the category they were in, that's the country they were in, that's the market. And so they looked at the different wants and needs in that market. And there are four ways we understand wants and needs. And we call them the four bases of segmentation. Basically, they're the four ways we cut up the pie. And we can use one or two or three or all of these 
in order to better understand our consumers. Your textbook doesn't have this nice table, but I'll post it anyway. So it's there. So there's geographic, demographic, psychographic, and behavioral. Um, so geographic segmentation, simple. Divide the market into different geographic units. Um, it's not clear or evident from that case study whether they bothered dividing China up into regions, um, whether they looked at, say, um, uh, launching in urban centers, or whether this was a suburban, rural, or different parts of China. But we don't know. They just talk about the country as a whole. But you can um, divide up, and this is particularly popular for local and hyper-local targeting. And sometimes you don't need to reach everyone in a country, or it's not relevant. So you could uh, use the criteria of segmenting the market based on different wants and needs in different countries. And Kraft certainly did that. <laughs> different cookies for China. Uh, regions, provinces, cities, you could do it on climate. Why would you do it based on climate? It's true. <laughs> You're going to have to share these with the, but yeah. Um, so think of a different product entirely. Like how many snowblowers get sold in Victoria? Not a lot. <laughs> Victoria has one snow plow, period. Like it just doesn't get a lot of snow. So you would, but you go to, you would go to Quebec, you go to Trois-Rivières, and everybody's got one. And the Canadian Tire has them lined up out front the way they line up lawnmowers here all year round, right? Um, and strangely, there are different preferences in Canada. Only West Coasters get old-fashioned ripple ketchup. Ketchup chips are a thing here, right? Um, elsewhere in the country, fries and gravy. Wow. Yeah. Would that, would that be nice? Um, so that was East Coast. Uh, we had wasabi la Lay's potato chips. We had curry Lay's potato chips. The whole country didn't get those. And um, so there's all different ways if. So the question you ask is if based on country, region, province, city, climate, population size, or type, people have different wants and needs, then you cut up your pie and say, look, this is really going to appeal to people on the, uh, people on the East Coast have different wants and needs than people on the West Coast, and not just with rap. <laughs> um, there's demographic segmentation, the classic pink razor tax, right? Do women need something different? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, a lot of smart marketers have figured out that women would just, we have more confidence when we pay more. So those pink razors cost more than the blue razors because the demographics have told them. But, on, you know, it's the most common method. It's also my least favorite. Why? Because I think it's facile. I don't think it gets to the why very well. It's kind of, it's easy. That's why it's the most used. Um, because it's really easy to say, oh, is it for a boy or is it for a girl? Oh, millennials, let's all lump you into a group and treat you all the same. Don't you love that? Because you're to everyone in this room, you're the same. So it's too easy. It's usually not enough, and it doesn't get to, remember last time we talked about the purchase decision-making process and all those influences? Age group to a certain degree, but not. It doesn't determine everything. Did Kraft look at the market and go, hmm, age? Uh, what age are we targeting? No, you could be 20 or 25 and they will sell you cookies. Not a big deal, right? Yes, they were going to families and they want kids to love Oreos because then you get lifetime loyalty. You probably had your first Oreo as a kid, and that's why you like them. There's that factor. Um, 
And you can find, we showed you the databases on Monday, the PRISM database, um, as well as Simply Map, that can layer on a lot of this demographic stuff on top of the geographic stuff, right? So now you have a little bit more to work with. And you already have two. And um, with the Simply Map, you have two things going for you. There's also self con uh, concept. And this one's really psychographic. So this is what PRISM was trying to show you. Um, and this is, okay, so not just what your age is or your gender or where you live, but trying to get a little bit more at how you think and what you value. Um, and it's really how you think about yourself um, and how you want to be thought of, right? So it's your self-concept. Um, and that can differ from your geography or, and that it's really what separates all of us. This is where the personality comes in. And PRISM, well, it lumps you into one of 68 groups, so obviously not an individualistic kind of thing, but still can be quite helpful. And so we can look at social class or lifestyle or personality to determine, okay, so who has different wants and needs because of how they think about themselves or how they want to be thought of or because of the kind of lifestyle they lead. And this starts getting a lot more interesting. Um, it's also a lot more difficult to find out. But this is really, really um, goes to the motivation behind a lot of what we buy in an affluent society, right? When it's beyond the basic needs and wants, the basic stuff, the lower level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that's pretty much based on geography, income, real super measurable stuff. But as we get wealthier, we start buying things for different reasons, right? Buying higher end stuff. And, but the best kind of segmentation, in my view, not in your textbook, but in my view, is behavioral. So it divides consumers based in groups based on what they do, based on their knowledge, their use, their responses to a product. So dude needs us, oh, poor Blackberry is not making Blackberries anymore. Do you hear that? Bye-bye, <laughs> QWERTY keyboard. It's all over. Um, but, uh, you know, they targeted the business market, right? Of people who needed to communicate with a cell phone, they offered, they knew they had different wants and needs about communication. And so the QWERTY keyboard, the Blackberry was it. Um, though, you know, okay, super cliche mom outside the supermarket. Uh, different need for a cell phone, right? Uh, everybody else with a cell phone, teenagers with cell phones, kids have cell phones. Different wants and needs, all phones, right? And it's based on how they will use them. What does a kid need a cell phone for? Need a cell phone for? Pokemon Go. Pokemon Go. <laughs> totally. We're at level 15. Team Red, no? Yeah. <laughs> My six-year-old still plays. Um, so, why does a kid need a cell phone, though? Emergencies. emergencies. Who said emergencies? Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, so different use cases, right? And so, does the phone have to have full features? Absolutely not. Um, it needs to be able to call emergency numbers and mom and dad, right? Um, and it probably should have a GPS tracker in it so you know where your kid is because, yeah, that's just the modern way, right? Um, so we can look at how we actually use something. And the cool thing we showed you in market research is um, all of the data that we collect about what we buy and what we buy repeatedly and when we buy it. A lot of the stuff that's going into databases, the clicks, we click on the emails, we open, all of that stuff is behavioral. And so we can trigger our marketing based on real-time data that we can collect in a lot of different ways, right? What do people do? So one of the things Shoppers was collecting was uh, in information about how you moved around the store, your behavior in the store. And they looked at how they could influence that, right? And different people, some people, 
You know, they go straight to the pharmacy counter and straight out. Other folks are doing all the aisles. You know, so how do you market differently to different people? Ideally, of course, you use these multiple bases of segmentation. So with PRISM and others, you can uh, target an area. And in that area, we'll overlay some census data. So you can find out what the average household size is, and income, uh, gender, all of that things, ethnicity, basic uh, demographic information is layered on top of geographic information. And then they add some behavioral stuff to it based on purchases um, and behavior and to come up with a sense of, based on those three, three things, what do we think their psychographics are? And which of the 68 categories do they fit into? And there's some super funny names to the categories. So if you haven't already Googled your, or looked up your PRISM segment, have a look. Um, pretty good. And so went back to my good friend at Passport um, and looked into the database and found an analysis of the Chinese market, the psychographics of the Chinese market. Um, and they categorized uh, people just into five different categories based on psychographics. Um, and they dove deep into each category and same idea, the traits, right? So we're looking at the psychographics, the self con uh, but then they have demographics on top of that. So they've already provided an analysis or a segmentation of the consumer shopping market for you to look at and figure out um, what they're going to respond to, what works and what doesn't. Um, and so this is what customer, what you have to do as a marketer. You have to, first of all, that key part is identifying the market and then go, okay, so do people have different wants and needs? That is, would they respond to a different marketing mix because of something about their demographics, psychographics, geographics, or behavior? Now, um, Businesses are also segmented, but businesses don't have psychographics because they don't have a self-concept uh, self because they don't have a self, technically. But if you've seen the corporation, you know that they have the rights of a person, but they're not people. So they buy for, they, we segment business markets in different ways. And so instead of demographics, which are for people, we, ha <coughs> we have firmographics. So firmographics are like company size, structure, is it a co-op, is it a corporation, is it a limited company, those kind of factors. And when, so we're looking at B2B market, selling to other businesses, what do we know about them and do they have different wants and needs based on those things? Do small businesses have different needs than big businesses? Heck yeah. So in most cases you would segment the market. Do really big companies have much different needs than big companies? If so, for your market, you would segment it again, right? But all you've done right now, though, to be clear, is cut up the pie. And lastly, um, one more bag of chips. Doesn't that sound good? No? With a beer? Oh. Uh, so, Mexico, you can get some Lay's Limon. Okay, so we look at the same things, but internationally, we have to understand that the cultural factors of different markets are going to shape, they change, right? Changing things. So, once we've got our pie all cut up, we want to look at it, evaluate where we've made those slices, and make sure that each piece of the pie is measurable. You know what size that slice is. That you can actually reach them. They're accessible. So if you wanted to reach billionaires in China with your Oreo cookie, that's actually really hard to do. Are you a how do you connect with them? Um, do you have access to that market? I um, mean, sometimes it's hard. You don't. Um, and then in which case, you can't target a market you can't possibly reach. It has to be substantial. So substantial usually means profitable, right? Differentiable. That means 
they really do have different wants and needs than the other slice of pie. If not, put them back together. Don't cut it up unnecessarily. Um, it's better to have four big pieces than eight little pieces if the four represent uh, different wants and needs. Um, and then it has to be actionable. Like, if you segment it based on something that you can't do anything about, oh, well, these people really want cookies that make them feel skinny. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's not Oreo's business. They do have Oreo lights, though, now, and Oreo thins. But the thins are not meant to make you think you're thin. It's supposed to be a sophisticated cookie, right? So Oreos are for kids. And for people with more sophisticated wants and needs, Oreo thins. Um, if you have want to Google Oreos and look at like, just Google images and look at all the flavors of Oreos in the North American market, you will get the sense that they know there are a lot of different wants and needs, even within um, you know, the cookie market, even amongst their loyal customers. So the choice then is, so you've gone back, your pie is in eight pieces, let's say. You are not going to then market to all of those pieces. For the same reasons we divide up the pie, because people have different wants and needs, so you would need a different marketing mix. That is a different product and or place and or price and or promotion strategy for each of those eight pieces. Can you do that? Probably not. Can you afford to do that? Probably not. And so you don't. You choose which piece makes the most sense for our company to target. And you might target more than one piece of the pie, but you will probably choose your favorite flavor first, and then you choose the next favorite flavor as your next target market. For example, we talked about, um, in labs at least, about Nintendo having the most genius market expansion strategy ever with the Wii. The, so with the Nintendo Wii, they started with teen and tween boys, right? That was the first segment of the non-gamer market they went after. But by the end, then they went through families, younger kids, yoga moms, they even went all the way to seniors, right? Remember the seniors bowling in their living room, looking all Freedom 55, right? Like they went through all of the segments, they prioritized them, and then they chose the ones that made the most sense for them first and went through. So you have to evaluate the segments um, to decide which of those segments can I serve, should I serve, and not all segments are equal. They, you might look at how big it is. The biggest market usually looks the best, but that's not all there is to it. It might be, look, somebody already owns that segment. Like if Nintendo decided to go after hardcore gamers because they spend the most, they would find themselves going head to head with Xbox. And they didn't want to do that. They weren't trying to meet those same wants and needs either. So they did not choose that segment despite its size and profitability. Um, oh, the E got fell off there, substitute. Um, and it's also, okay, so what are we really in business to do? Who are we here to serve? Um, who do we, what fits with our mission and values? Well, how do we want to grow our business? Um, what do we want to be? And finally, we'll look at, okay, can we afford to do this segment? Can we afford to do more than one segment? What can we do? Um, and then, once you've done that, you get to target them. So you decide you're going to target them. And there's four different ways. So essentially, there's the mass marketing, where you treat everyone to the same product, place, promotion, and price. So one Oreo for everyone. Right? Or you have differentiated or concentrated our niche. So undifferentiated is super rare because that's the whole mass market thing. And there's not really, even amongst in this room, 
There's, we probably all use different, even toothpastes, right? Drink different coffee, like different cookies. Um, all of those things are different. So mass marketing, um, it's kind of the, it's like the amateur move. Like you, this is, this is um, the number one reason in my freelance business I turn down prospects is when I ask them who their target market, and they said, everyone. I was like, oh, good luck with that. And I step away. Uh, can I recommend someone else? Because I will never satisfy them. I can never deliver on that, ever. And I don't want to be doing marketing that's useless. So undifferentiated, rarely, if ever, used. Differentiated, again, we go with the knees. So it's one product. And in the we case, one product, one place, you could buy them all at the same places, one price, but the only thing they changed was the promotion strategy, right? It was the Nintendo Wii for different markets, um, but promoted as, oh, it's a way of bringing the family together. Oh, it's easy to start up. Oh, it's healthy, right? These different messages for the different groups because they have different wants and needs, but they can all be met with the same product. They just need to be, needs to be done in a different way, right? Or there's differentiated, right? And so that is your product actually has to be different for different customers. Because, I mean, we could throw Depends up there too. Like they're all diapers. But they, uh, this is, look, if you look, Huggies has like a lot of bloody diapers. And then they have different sizes of all of those. Sometimes like different character sets or different gendered versions. That's expensive to do, right? So differentiated is a way more expensive way of marketing, but it better meets the needs of customers, right? I'm not going to put depends on a newborn, right? Um, so, you know, you have to do that. Okay, my, this is one of my favorite slides of all time. <laughs> These are real life magazines that are clearly for some pretty niche markets. These are not for everybody. How many of you are subscribers to one of these? Uh, Bacon Busters is an Australian magazine for people who like to hunt wild hogs. And they're looking for calendar girls. <laughs> right? Niche publications. Di and miniature donkey tails. No judging. OK, a little, because that's weird, right? But um, these are all profitable publications. They don't aim to reach everyone. They don't even want to meet the needs of all people who like bacon. And most people like bacon, right? They are super niche. And that's, they serve the needs of that community, that segment, really well. And they do super well in it. And you can probably think in your own life of something that's really customized um, that you like because of that. It doesn't meet everyone's needs. And we can even go to the point of, you know, a lot of the big brands that we typically use a differentiated strategy um, also offer this kind of micro one-to-one. -one. You can customize your Nikes to the nth degree, right? Um, so technology means that even when you buy a phone or a laptop, you customize it. You get all the bits and pieces to make it your own. So which kind of strategy does Oreo have in China? Sorry? Who said that over here? Yeah, do you like that? Da, da, da. Yeah, differentiated. Um, that's the first part of this week. So your homework, finish up chapter seven. We're gonna cover the rest of it on Tuesday. Midterm review is Thursday next week. You wanna know about the midterm? Don't email me, I will not email you back. It's gonna be at the midterm review. See you, come get your cookies. <laughs>